You need to find your reliable process and then you find tools to monitor that process. And having rows test or you know the different terms that are used for this particular test are, are great because you've built that on other results. So you've built it on reliability. Yeah, I mean, we used to have a criteria for some of our boards which were three times the standard IPC or MOD standard, but we knew why we got a high number. But it didn't have any effect on reliability. So, you know, when customers used to come in to us say, but you're not using the standard. No, we've got this backup proof. We've done this. We've done the SIR and all the other reliability stuff. We know why we get a bigger number, and this is the proof and they went away happy. So I think that we're getting to a situation where people are trying to understand that a bit better, um, not through work I've done specifically, but you know, over the years, everybody has done little bits of work which we put together and now we better understand the tools we have and the benefits those tools give us. That's my guest, Bob Willis, next on Reliability Matters. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome to our 40th episode. Our first episode of Reliability Matters aired on December 12th, 2018. My first guest was Bob Willis, and I'm happy to say Bob has returned 39 episodes later. Bob operates a training and consultancy business based in England. Bob is a member of the Smart Group Technical Committee, now known as SMTA Europe. Bob was chairman of the Smart Group from 1990 to 1994 and was elected honorary president for life. Bob has provided training and consultancy in most areas of electronic manufacturing for well over 30 years, and I'm thrilled to have Bob as my first and now 40th guest. I spoke with Bob from his home office in England. Now, here's my conversation with Bob Willis. Bob Willis, welcome back to Reliability Matters. I'm so glad that you have agreed to come back for a little bit more punishment. Well, thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure. Well, Bob, you were my first guest on this podcast. That episode aired on December 12th, 2018. Uh, and now uh, this is episode number 40. So uh, thanks for coming back. And uh, so much, it's a complete understatement, but so much has changed since December 12th, 2018, when we first uh, recorded the episode one of this podcast. Well, yeah, I think it has. But um, I think we're very resilient um, in our industry. I think we're very resilient uh, as nations. And I hope that uh, everybody can just step back for a moment, think about what they're doing, think about what they're saying, uh, and apply a, a bit of common sense. And also, you know, not criticise uh, our governments, um, you know, regardless of your affiliation, is that uh, the majority of people in government uh, and in senior positions are doing something uh, which has never been seen, never really experienced before. It's all different for everybody. And I think we just have to not get on their cases all the time. Yeah, that's. I, I think that's. There'll, there'll be a time for that, right? There'll be a time for critiquing, you know, the, the speed of which every government in the world uh, took this seriously. There'll be a time for critiquing communication at the early days of this uh, of this pandemic but now is not the time i totally agree and uh, and i also agree with your statement regardless of your affiliation um everyone's kind of on it now <laughs> i think maybe everyone but one person in the entire world but but everyone is pretty pretty much on it now. <laughs> maybe two um there everyone is taking it seriously and and i think the people downflow in the downflow part of the of the government you know the civil servants and and not the political appointees, but the but the the actual people in the trenches that have served multiple administrations. These people are really doing their job, and I think industry is really coming together, and people in general are really coming together. That 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 uh, gives me some level of optimism that you know we'll get through this, and uh, for many of us, obviously not all, but for hopefully the majority of us, uh, will be. Uh, stronger for it. 
I think that uh, the nice thing about it is we're we're really thinking about um, the people that we know, the perhaps the people we haven't spoken to in a long time, and I've actually got a post-it note here of 25 people, and I'm slowly going through those and just picking out people and giving them a call. Um, you know, people I've known, people I've worked with that, uh, you know, sort of perhaps retired from the industry or uh, just not in the industry and just give them a call. Um, some some of them are really surprised to hear from me, but <laughs> I just think, you know, if everybody does that sort of thing, just, you know, just take a little bit of time, you know, and just do that, communicate, which we should be doing anyway. But unfortunately, we generally tend uh, to focus on you know our, our priorities our, our personal priorities but we've got to think about other people yeah yeah for sure I've been doing the same thing I I was grateful to receive that email from you that had pictures from 2005 that was a that was a time machine uh, that came out of the blue but um, I think we were working together at a show um, I think we supplied some equipment for uh, your booth or something to that effect and you had a, a whole bunch of uh, people that are, uh, I think, mostly still in the industry. It was a, it was a nice flashback. Yeah, I, I, I do keep photographs of things and events because uh, I may be able to use them somewhere in the future. Now, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm, I'm just taking a leap here. Your, your consultancy is uniquely set up in that. I believe the last time we spoke, you were telling me that most of the work that you do uh, for your clients is done remotely, not exclusively, but at least a lot of it is, is done remotely. And that was before remote became the only possibility, right? Like we have today. Um, so how has this COVID-19 situation affected uh, your consultancy service? And uh, do you find that the your early adoption of virtual meetings and online trainings has helped today? I think yes, but I think that um, a lot of people haven't really picked up on it uh, early enough. I mean, it's not rocket science. Uh, I know that you're involved with it as well. And I think that um, we can do it and we can train people, we can educate people, you know, worldwide. I think that um, it is inevitable with somebody like me, I'm really a hands-on guy, so I love doing hands-on training courses. So it is a bit difficult in some respects, but because you know, over the last sort of 30, 40 years, I've produced so many little video clips, which are quite unique to me. There's, I don't think there's anybody else in the industry does it like I do with video clips. So I can, I can show something which can be done online, and it's only five or six seconds, but it can show something that uh, is difficult to explain. So I like doing that. But I must say, I love training production staff because it's more fun it's more demanding and I probably said this in a previous interview um, because I really believe it and I started off training doing that sort of thing production staff when I was at uh, GEC all those years ago doing the online consultancy in terms of failure analysis I mean I did two this morning um, one was a freebie <laughs> one was paid for um, but you know I helped somebody out I've seen it before and one of the nice things is if you've seen it before, recorded it before, you can actually say, well, here's a picture of one I did earlier. Does it look the same as yours? So if you just get a little bit of information, you can normally solve a problem. Now, now there, are, there are times when, you know, I completely miss the point. There's times that uh, I go off on a tangent and think it's this and it's not. It's something else. But, uh, you know, it can work. And there's a very well-known U.S. consultant who I was having a word with uh, literally this afternoon about doing webinars. And I said, look, if you take some time out, I'll help you. I'll show you how to do it. I'll do some for you. You know, I will help. I've got no problem with, um, you know, helping people out in that way because I think it's a, it's a great way of providing a very cost-effective service uh, to the industry. Um, I don't... I kind of get upset when I see people jumping on the bandwagon uh, and other people starting to do it because of the situation. But then again, you know, as a, a smaller company, they have to adapt and have to adapt very quickly if they're going to pay the bills. So, but bigger organisations jumping on the bandwagon of doing uh, this type of service, I don't really appreciate. So our industry, Bob, is... is um somewhat blessed these days because most of the electronics industry, if not all, but certainly a great portion of the electronics industry has been deemed an essential business. Whether that is a 
directly essential business because we are building respirators or building missiles or whatever, uh, communication gear, or we're downflow from there. Um, you know, my company, Aqueous Technologies, received a letter from DOD, you know, saying, yep, you know, you're, you're, you're part of the, you're part of the chain. Uh, we received letters from several major military prime contractors saying, you need to stay working because you're part of our essential business. So most of the industry is, is uh, at least the electronic assembly industry is, is still in business. So with that said, if you were to look into your crystal ball, who will be the winners and the losers in these specific times? You know, obviously, if you're building respirators, winner, right? Uh, we need that. But will there be losers in, in, in our industry? And will there be winners in our industry? Will, or will everyone just keep going on as, as, as normal as possible? I think that um, it depends, obviously, on the company and the management. Uh, I think there are quite a few companies that, uh, unfortunately, due to their financial situation or their profitability, uh, will not survive. I think that um, it's extraordinarily difficult for um, you know the government to subsidise everybody. And we're starting to get to a situation where, you know, it's not just our electronics companies uh, that we're talking about, it's all the charities, because they're providing a valuable service that can't be provided by our uh, NHS. Um, but if we just talk about electronics, um, you know, you know, there are many instances where it's very, very difficult to follow the rules of the government uh, from a health and safety point of view, insurance point of view. But we are in situations also where the unions are getting involved, and in some cases rightly so, for those companies that are flouting the rules. The biggest problem, I guess, is communication of the rules. You know, we have basic understanding, but there is grey areas um, which are interpreted differently. So to answer your question, I think there are going to be winners and losers, but I think we're generally going to go back to the same position, but possibly less people in the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues we have in this country is, you know, we have several forms of government. We have uh, municipal government, uh, which would be the smallest government. That would be a city or a town. Uh, then we have county, which obviously en encompasses several cities or towns. And then we have the state and we have the federal government. And there are cities that are making their own rules, and there are counties that are making their own rules. Then we have states, like my state, California, which has, you know, made a rule that covers the entire state. Then we have the federal government, which could do, you know, something uh, uniform for all 50 states and, and territories. So there, there are a lot of uh, ambiguities in all of these rules. And, um, you know, we've given our employees letters from... Um, our contractors in DOD that, that describe us as essential, uh, just in case we ever get to the point where one city or one county or one state says, okay, we're going to send the police out and pull cars over uh, and, and question why they're out of their home. So, you know, that hasn't happened yet, uh, and I hope it doesn't, but, um, but, you know, we're certainly prepared if it does. But the, it would be nice if there was a, you know, federal response to this, because there are some states that think they don't have a problem because they're not testing. And then there are some states that really know they have a problem and they're really making some responsible decisions. And this is how, this has to be kind of an all or nothing deal. You know, you can't have the weakest link, you know, reinfect everybody when this is all over. So it, it, it's going to be interesting to see as this becomes our new normal, at least for the, for the short term, if there's any uniformity in, in what the restrictions are so that it either all works or it all fails, but at least it, it all happens together. Outside of COVID, we've talked about COVID over the last few episodes. So I'm, I'm kind of anxious to, even though it is the elephant in our room and it will be for some time and we have to acknowledge it, uh, I, I kind of like to get out of that COVID reality and, and talk about you know other stuff. Like what's going on in the electronics industry, Bob, from, from your perspective? You've been around forever. And uh, I say that as a term of endearment. You've seen... Yeah, you're on the on the response side when something goes wrong. Um, they call you, or and people like yourself, consultants. Um, so, so from your perspective, what's going on right now in our industry? Uh, I guess my the flavor of the day, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm just messing around with uh, you know low temperature solders, and it's because it uh, be became more popular over the last uh, couple of years. Um, so it was something new to try out. Um, I'd done some work with uh, uh, zinc alloys uh, when I was uh, looking at lead-free back in, back in the day. 
Um, I did some work sort of about five years ago with a couple of companies. But because it became the flavor of the day, uh, I've been doing more and also looking for the more exotic materials. I spent uh, probably four weeks trying to get um, uh, one of the low temperature alloys which have uh, an epoxy built into the fluxing system which basically you solder it to the board and then the epoxy sticks the joint to the board. So it gives it more reliability. Um, but, Is that because uh, low temperature a... uh, alloys um have less adhesive quality to it or is that in case um Brit it's it, brittleness it's, it's brittleness okay all right yeah that it's brittleness sense. but um so but i've used i've used it just recently to solve a, a lead-free problem uh but only on wire terminations and it's worked quite successfully in a, a fairly hostile environment and then i've used it um or, no i've evaluated it with a customer which uh, unfortunately he choose, chose the wrong alloy and had some problems but i wouldn't have recommended it in the first place but it was interesting to see you know real life failures as opposed to you know temperature cycling failures which i've generated myself who's using low temperature why are they using low temperature what applications benefit from low temperature solders well with the low temperature solders uh, you are theoretically using less energy so there's less energy consumption you can work at lower temperatures so th again theoretically you can source components which will stand up to temperatures you know lower than lead free so you're getting a cost advantage there but the the problem there is it's okay in theory, but actually being able to source them. Because if you go to a supplier who makes connectors, for instance, he will probably only make connectors with a high temperature plastic. Whereas he used to make them with a low temperature plastic, he converted everything to uh, for lead free and then dumped the other stuff because there's no point in having two items in your infantry, which is uh, fundamentally the same, even though you make more profit on one than the other. So the th in theory, it's good from that perspective to save a bit of money. There's not a lot of money to be saved uh, on the laminate material for the PCBs. Um, so it's mainly energy cost and then the environmental friendliness is a benefit. You, to answer your question about who's using it, it tends to be sort of professional business type electronics um, that's using it. Hewlett Packard, IBM, um, the IBM spin-off, uh, which uh, makes um, the uh, laptops. Um, they've been doing it for about four years uh, now. So, you know, the, there's, there's areas that are using the technology. But that's just sort of one thing I've been interested in. Um, I went back and started doing some more work with preforms. And, you know, I started my career with reflow soldering solder preforms with vapor phase back in the day um, so because that became an interest uh, of mine uh, because some companies were providing uh, what I call solder bricks or as Indium calls them solder fortification a bit of marketing there <laughs> I would Basically, say the marketing lump, people got a hold of it yeah yeah it's a lump of solder uh, and you know that interested me for certain applications so you know I see something and I want to play, um, and I guess sort of those have been the things of, of interest to me recently that I've been playing about with. And I've always had a love for um, video simulation and simulation of soldering or simulation of any process. And I've got a webinar coming up specifically on soldering simulation. And I can remember the very first time I took solder paste and reflowed it, I wanted to compare product A, product B, and product C, so I stuck it under a video camera. So I, I captured it. I could see the degree of slump, the, the amount of solder balling, the residue change in color, all these things, and you've got it then to go back and review. And, you know, there are a number of companies that offer that equipment to the marketplace, and it's such a valuable resource, and, of course, obviously I've made a living out of making videos for, for many years. When someone calls you and asks a technical question, are there issues that are so common that you can answer their, you, you can complete their sentence <laughs> before it gets out of their mouth? You know, like I have a problem with, and then you go voiding or whatever. Is, is there is there something right now that's that's so common that, that so many people are looking for uh, solutions to it that you could you could just you know predict the question? I think. Absolutely. And it's not, I, please, uh, I hope your listeners won't take it the wrong way. But yes, 
Um, you know, most of the problems uh, I've seen before, I've experienced my four, I fell over before, and you can see it. And as long as you get the right information from the, uh, the customer, uh, you can solve a lot of the problems very simply with an online conversation, a couple of photographs, something like that. So something you can see visually or somebody can photograph visually, then I can point them in the right direction. I will say to them, OK, if you do this, this and this with this board or this component on the shop floor, it's only going to take you a few minutes. You can eliminate the necessity for sending it out to a laboratory. So you can prove to yourself that if you put A and B together, you get C. Um, you don't get what you want. So that then says, OK, it's either a material problem, it's a process problem, it's a board problem, etc. When you have to go the next stage, i.e. prove it in a court of law or if you have to prove it to a vendor, then, yeah, you might have to go to a laboratory and have the standard test done. But I think that if you do the simple stuff early on, quickly, and then give it to the vendor and say, look, I've done this, done that, this is what I get. This is clearly not, you know, my process problem. Um, if you do that quick enough, before the legal people get involved, you can normally win the case without spending a lot of money. But conversely, you know, I've worked for uh, uh, a couple of companies where, you know, I've actually gone and recommended they do so a certain thing, which costs a lot of money. But sometimes you have to invest that to prove the point, to convince the company that you're uh, uh, fighting against, that it's their problem. Um, so you bring the science to play. I bring the knowledge to play or the experience or the old age to play. But sometimes you have to bring in the science as well. Yeah, I, I've talked about this uh, almost ad nauseum in this, um, in this show about how some of the uh, wise experienced sages in our industry are retiring and companies are not replacing them with the next wisest, most sagest, you know, um, a person. And, and there's now a new flow of young blood coming into our industry, um, in, in the form of, you know, new engineers who are, who are skilled or let me, let me rephrase that. They are educated, but they're not necessarily experienced. So, uh, where, an average engineer might see one problem once or twice, the same problem once or twice in their career. A consultant sees it a hundred, two hundred, thousand times in their career, um, and uh, so there is a w with the evaporation of a lot of the internal quote unquote Bob Willis's uh, in in a business. Sometimes they they're going to have to go out to another external quote unquote, Bob Willis or, or consultant. Um, so are, are you seeing that, um, that increase in inquiries because the internal go-to people are no longer there? Is, is that, are you seeing that in your industry at all? I would, I wouldn't say ne necessarily. I would say that a lot of the companies that um, do contact me haven't got that, number of engineering staff to start off with um, and when they have a problem um, sometimes it's you know design related or they're putting a product to an environment it wasn't designed for um, they're doing you know things just wrong and they haven't really thought it through or they rely on the data sometimes they get from suppliers um, so they read the spec sheet the spec sheet says x y and z so they follow it rather than actually thinking what they're doing and doing some simple trials. So I think that the more people do, and I know that everybody says, I haven't got time for that, but good engineering, uh, if thought through, doesn't have to take a lot of time. Well, what's the old um, saying? Doing we don't the have, sensible things. The old saying, we don't have time to do it right, but we'll find the time to do it over? Yeah, and, you know, in generally speaking, uh, it takes longer, it costs you more, but you've got to always think about the customer. Um, is the customer going to come back to you if you screw up too many times? So what's the problem of the day right now, Bob? What's the problem du jour that we're seeing? Is there, is there a, a common theme going on right now in our industry? 
Well, the the last the last three sort of little projects I've had, uh, one has been dear to your heart, which is uh, dendrite failures, which you know it happens on a regular basis. Um, next one is you know solder joint fracture, um, which is, was what I alluded to with the low temperature materials using a product perhaps in the wrong environment. And um, the third one was uh, PCB failures. Um, I try whenever I can with a PCB failure. This is an electrical failure. Now, I'm not an electrical guy. I'm a mechanical guy, hands-on type guy. But if I can find some simple way of showing or proving, you know, what the, re the root cause is. So my first, my first usual thing is to do x-ray. Now, x-ray is not perfect for very small features, but quite often it can find something as long as you have got a good x-ray system. Um, the next thing obviously is to, if it's simple things like delamination, I just, you know, rip the board apart and look at the two pieces. So, I, you know, if it's a sandwich, you rip the sandwich apart and see if I have got all the ham I ordered. You know, <laughs> you, you, because you've seen something before, you know how it should look and you see what is wrong with it, i.e. it doesn't look as it should look. Um, you can't prove the point, but you know it's wrong, and the supplier will know it's wrong as well. So those are sort of the things that um, you know I enjoy doing, and I think you get, hopefully, a, a fast return uh, to the customer in terms of defects. So those are the sort of three defects. And it still amazes me that after all the discussion in the industry, promotion, you know, I'm a... I'm a I originally came from a clean background. I cleaned everything. You know, I went with the majority of the industry to no clean technology. But you still have to invest the time and effort to get it right. And if you do that, a lot of uh, applications can successfully use no clean and no clean with conformal coating. But when you don't do the basics right, you will always have a problem. Um, and if you design incorrectly or use the product incorrectly, um, you know, you're going to get failures. And, and sometimes people jump on it and say, right, if we do this, that will solve the problem. Hold on. Let's look at this logically. What did you do to start off with? What are you looking as a solution? And is that right for that particular product? Or are you actually going to generate more problems by jumping quickly? Yeah. yeah. On the cleaning subject, we um, routinely tell our, um, our listeners and our, or our attendees to the workshops or webinars that, you know, do you need to clean? Do you not need to clean? It, you know, it, it is a, it depends answer. And every assembly has a residue tolerance. And if, if you're under that threshold, you're fine. If you're over that threshold, you got to do something. And, and uh, it's not a one answer fits all. And the other point to that is if you are going to clean, which, you know, obviously we're proponents of cleaning and we have a horse in the race. So clearly, uh, but, but if you are going to clean, if you can't clean well, then don't clean. You know, that's one of the few times I'll be on the mountaintop yelling, don't clean folks, if you can't do it well, because if you do it uh, improperly, your board is way worse than it was before you attempted to clean it. It is an all or nothing proposition. I say, it's not like horseshoes and hand grenades. It's not as close as you can get, you know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's right on or, or don't, you know, go big or go home, that type of thing. Well, the first time I had a, a conversation with you about cleaning, um, uh, you actually told me about uh, sometimes, very occasionally, uh, you would sell your, your batch cleaners with glass windows in or glass doors on. Yeah. And you said that you help, that helped you with development, which is obvious. If you can see what's actually happening, you can say, oh, if I tweak this, if I do that, that's much, much quicker than actually doing a trial where you can't see what's going on. So right. I think that video simulation or any sort of simulation is a, such a powerful tool. If you can see what's going on, you can solve a problem much more readily. Sure. I can remember those videos you made, you know, quite a few years ago, um, you know, using glass slides, as I did when I was a kid, again, with glass slides on boards and then fishing them out the cleaner afterwards when they snapped. Um, yeah. <laughs> occasionally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, evidently they didn't like the heat. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's um, it's amazing what you can learn when you see. You know, it's amazing what you can see when you look. It it's that sounds very rudimentary, but it starts there. Labs are always there. Labs will determine you know much of your issue, but it takes time and it takes money. 
And, and usually the answer is right in front of you. I always refer to the definition of consultant, and I've said it on this show before, and I don't, this is, this is actually a, not an insult for a consultant, although it might sound at first like one. The definition of a consultant is um, someone hires you to tell them what time it is. And the first thing the consultant does is ask to borrow the client's watch. And, and, and that means the answers are all there. The customer just can't see it, but the answers are right there, uh, you know, in front of them, just hiding in plain sight. That has been my experience when we try and troubleshoot something is we just need to find a different way to see it, to look at it. And, uh, and there it is, whether it's a glass door on that analogy or, or slides or whatever, uh, if we can see it, we can fix it. But quite often the customer doesn't give you the whole story. And that's, that's also the problem that when you're trying to, oh, he doesn't need to know that. Yeah. Um, that's irrelevant. No, tell me the whole story. It's just like a doctor. You tell him the whole story. He's more likely to give you a better um, prescription. He's going to advise you better. Tell him the whole story, not the bit you want to tell him, all the story. Yeah, we have that problem in our service department that, you know, someone will call and say, you know, this part of the machine's not turning on. So we'll say, okay, let's start from the beginning. Have you checked the breaker? Oh, yeah, 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 breaker's fine. And then we fly out there and the breaker's turned off. Yeah, because they, 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 uh, they don't want the easy solution. They want to, go, to, you know, to dig a well and go really deep and start mining for solutions. And usually, um, what's the, uh, th there's a medical term, uh, someone, something razor. Um, my, my listeners will write in with what it is. Uh, anyway, it's a medical term where, uh, something to the effect of the the diagnosis is or the problem is generally the most obvious. It's it's the most common. Start there. Uh, it, chances are it's not something way out in left field. It's something that's very basic and so basic that the customer doesn't even start looking at that level. They go deeper. And and uh, I don't know if that's been your experience, but that's been my experience when people bring us in to, to solve a cleaning issue. Um, they're, they're looking too deep and the problem is a little closer to the surface. Well, one of the things that uh, I always like to do is if I'm working in a facility, uh, I just tell the engineer, just go away. <laughs> let me just wander around. Let me, let me wander around, let, look on the shop floor. You've told me what uh, I've got to wear. You've told me about my ESD. I'll, I'll follow every procedure you want, but just let me wander around myself. Let me talk to your operators because, as I, I probably said before, that, uh, you know, the operators know what's actually happening in the real world. And, you know, they may technically not understand some things, but they know a lot and you can learn a lot and hopefully solve problems if we listen to the correct people. Yeah, there's a, in management classes, the, they, they teach a, a um, technique called MBWA, management by walking around. And it is just walking around your factory floor, walking around your office, whatever the case may be, and talking to people and listening. And more problems can be found by walking around and listening and talking uh, to people than, um, you know, under a microscope. I mean, the two, uh, the t there are two times uh, in my career where I've really enjoyed that sort of freedom. Once was uh, in, uh, in Finland uh, working for Nokia. Uh, I can't remember the name of the company, um, but in Dallas, uh, I was over there for uh, four days and the guy said, look, these are a couple of things I want you to look at, but just wander around, talk to the staff, and then come back to me each night and sort of tell me what you think. Uh, and I really enjoyed that. And from the reception he got, it worked, you know, the whole thing worked well in the end. Um, so that was, and sometimes people just want to say, look there, look there, don't look any, anywhere else. But quite often, the root cause of the problem is somewhere else. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Yeah. Um, you talked about dendrit dendritic growth. Are, are you getting a lot of calls or any calls about the new cleanliness testing uh, part of the J, the new J standard, the Section 8 of J standard 001G that requires um, objective evidence and SIR and ROSE and all that stuff? Personally, I think that uh, there should always have been that. Um, I agree. If we sort of step, if we step back, you know, the we we have tools which um, you know we can use to evaluate different processes, 
and then we can use longer term testing to uh, agree, uh, validate those, those, those results. Um, but we can also look for short term methods. I mean, about a year ago, year and a half ago, um, I started doing immersion testing. So we take an assembly, we've, we've conformally coated it, we'll power it up and stuff it in a bucket full of water. And then if we really get adventurous, we'll stick it in a bucket full of seawater. Mm-hmm. And we'll see the effect. Now, you know, that test or test method methodology has been in German specifications for a long, long time. And I saw it referred to in a book which uh, somebody had written. And I thought, that's a neat idea. I'll have a go at that. And I had th- two, two or three companies contact me said, can you do some work for us using your immersion test? And I said, look, there's no standard. It's basically showing you where there isn't any conformal coating. But if you then took that, you could use that as a validation test quickly, simply, within a few minutes, and then build that into other processes. And it's the same with the the work that uh, MPL have done with um, condensation testing, where we, we, we take an assembly, you change the temperature of the assembly and the climate that it's in, and condense moisture onto the surface. But you can actually control the amount, whereas the original test that the automotive used to use, basically you had condensation, but it wasn't controlled. You know, you get a big lump here and a few more spots over there. There wasn't really a control to it. So the nice thing about the the projects that MPO are doing right now is the standard SIR, which they've been doing for customers for a long, long time, uh, now doing condensation, but looking at the benefit of the simple sort of five or ten minute test where you stick it in a bucket full of water. So those, all those things together, I think, are a useful tool. Uh, they are kind of the real world, if you like, um, but we must take the benefit of what we used to use for so many years. I mean, the technology you use uh, and other people supply for doing contamination testing, I used to use that, and I've always used that as a process control tool and i know there's one engineer in our industry talks about process control specifically but it's true you know you need to find your reliable process and then you find tools to monitor that process and having rose test or you know the different terms that are used for this particular test are, are great because you've built that on other results so right. you've built it on reliability by something. yeah yeah, I mean, we used to have a criteria for some of our boards, which were three times the standard IPC or MOD standard, but we knew why we got a high number, but it didn't have any effect on reliability. So, you know, when customers used to come in to us, say, but you're not using the standard. No, we've got this backup proof. We've done this. We've done the SIR and all the other reliability stuff. We know why we get a bigger number, and this is the proof. And they went away happy. So I think that we're getting to a situation where people are trying to understand that a bit better, um, not through work I've done specifically, but, you know, over the years, everybody has done little bits of work which we put together, and now we better understand the tools we have and the benefits those tools give us. I think one of the benefits, and there really are no real benefits, but just to make a point, one of the benefits of COVID-19 is that we're not hearing a whole lot about Brexit anymore. That's kind of in the shadows uh, with all this other um, drama that's occurring. How, uh, now that Brexit has been formalized, although not every part of the UK is out of everything European yet, that's gonna take, uh, I think, the rest of this year. Um, What changes, if any, face the UK electronic assembly industry now and moving forward from from your perspective there? Well, from my perspective, I haven't got a clue. (laughs) Probably no one does. Maybe if they do, they're they're lying. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I suppose people can theorize about what might happen, what, you know, this, this might be an impact. But in reality, until all the rules are put down uh, in paper and agreed, we really don't know. From a, from a fundamental point of view, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, dealing with other companies, taxation and stuff like that. That's a sort of fundamental thing that I've got to be aware of. But uh, apart from that, I will just be told what to do and either not charge somebody 
tax or charge somebody tax or charge the US tax or, you know, I'll be told what to do. But that's that's what we're waiting for, you know, some specific guidelines. And, and until they've got it agreed, um, but I still, I personally think, I personally think um, that that's going to still take a long, long time. And I, I kind of don't think that we're actually going to get out of the woods anytime soon. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a, a fair comment. Are there any standards, any EU standards that fall on our industry that will no longer be applicable or will have to be readopted um, in, in a more local level? There's been a lot of discussion about this, um, you know, through uh, you know the unions concerned about workers' rights and things like this. I think that you know anything that uh, we uh, continue with will be for the good of the com- country. Um, we all know about the sort of straight bananas, bent bananas and things. You know, that's, that's, that's foolishness. It always has been. But when we talk about um, the things that are in place, I think we'll just continue to adopt them or retain them. Um, and we'll write our own or write our own path as we continue. So I think that we'll just apply common sense. But I don't think anybody's really going to lose out um, in terms of legislation and standards because of it. That's good. Um, by the time my audience hears this, this may have already occurred, but I read about a charity webinar that you are putting on, sponsored by a, a couple of industry magazines, I think Circuits Assembly and, um, and Global SMT. When is that scheduled for? And tell me what that's about. Well, it's uh, scheduled for next week. Okay, so th- this um, I, already occurred to my listening no, audience. This already occurred a few weeks ago, uh, but but tell me what that's about, what the motivation was, what the content is, and uh, whether you'll do that again moving forward. I am trying to do that uh, again. Um, I've already spoken to sort of three magazines uh, in the UK, and um, a show organizer in the UK. I've also spoken to the people who produced my book on pin and hole intrusive reflow 007. I've asked them about doing uh, an event and, you know, suggested it and said how it would work and all that sort of good thing. And I, I just think, you know, what can I do which may be a benefit uh, to charities? So I just thought, okay, this is something I can do. Um, and we said, okay, if, if people want to turn up and listen, that's great. If they want to turn up and, uh, actually um, donate um, you know a few dollars a few pounds to a charity not through me not through through the magazines that's great um, I would have loved to have got uh, two or three you know sponsors because you know that's a sort of a more of a perhaps a lump sum uh, to uh, to give to uh, relevant charities either in the US or uh, in the UK but it's just it just I just thought what can I do I mean, the other thing that I've been trying to do with little success so far is uh, get my walking football team to have a keepy-uppy competition. Um, so basically, I, I last weekend I took a ball in the back garden and took about 30 minutes to video it and get it right for about five seconds of video. Basically keeping up soccer, so juggling the ball between both feet. Mm-hmm. And all I wanted to do is a keepy-uppy conga. So the idea is that uh, anybody <laughs> basically does a little video themselves, sends it in, I'll put it on to the other one and we'll create a conga line. Um, so you, you, you're featuring one person at a time, so it's not a true conga line, but you know what I mean. And a virtual conga um, line, like a Zoom version yeah. of a conga line. Yeah, and you know, I thought, okay, when I've got a few people participating, then what I'll do is then send uh, to a couple of... Uh, uh, Premier League teams, uh, suppliers in Premier League teams, and said, look, you guys are doing this all the time. You're sending these videos. Uh, let's do something useful with it. You don't have to go out and do it. You've already got this keepy-uppy competition with the loo rolls and proper footballs. I just add those, and that adds a little bit of interest uh, to our members. So that was that's the other thing I've been trying, kind of unsuccessfully <laughs> so far with. Um, but... You know, the video is available if anybody wants to watch it and wants to contribute. Send me those uh, video links and I'll put it in the show notes so that people have a chance to view it and contribute. And uh, um, that, that, should be, uh, that should be fun. I, have, I am not a soccer player. I'm not a football player in your vernacular. Um, so I don't know. 
But uh, with enough to drink and maybe with uh, a little bit of uh, video editing, maybe I, I can make it look like I can do it. Well, I, I offered it to my committee first of all, and I, uh, two people said they were injured. One said they injured <laughs> injured themselves trying to do it. One person said their wife told them not to go out in the garden again because they'd ruin the plants. Uh, <laughs> So I, I've had more excuses than footage so far. Right, right. Um, on a parting question here, I'll, I'll put you on the spot a little bit, and I'll leave the subject matter completely within your discretion. Leave our audience with one free tip from Bob Willis. If you were to tell someone to stop doing something or to start doing something, your choice, what would that something be? Just Whatever comes to the top of your head. And I'll edit out all the time it's taking you. To. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that's not really a fair question, but is there something that just, you know, you've had five calls this week on people uh, putting peanut butter on their board, you know, and stop putting peanut butter on your board, what, whatever the case may be. Uh, I'm, I, I kind of have to say it's going to be education related. I, I honestly believe that management, be it quality, production, should spend a bit more time providing education to production staff, management staff about all of the processes that we use today. PCB fab, assembly, soldering, cleaning, whatever it may be. And take that information so everybody can participate. Um, I've done it a few times in, in my career where I've uh, worked within the company and we've just done simple training sessions, you know, for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you know, once every week or once every couple of weeks on a chosen subject. And that then builds into a, a reservoir of material that can be used by the company forevermore. I mean, that's education, I think, is just so important. Uh, for younger engineers to get the experience, um, but also for older engineers that uh, think they know everything. Uh, and none of us know everything. Every, everybody has a new experience. So I can learn from people. I recently just learned, uh, I saw something that Cisco were doing. I thought, that's a good idea. I haven't got the budget to do what they did, but I can do it the Bob Willis way. And I get kind of the same result, so I'm pleased. So I can learn just like anybody else, and that's what it's all about. Learning as much as you can from as many people, and that's how you build up experience and also your practical knowledge as well. No, that's, that is great advice. And there are a, a number of, of uh, portals where people can start learning, um, either for free or for uh, membership. Uh, if you're a member of a trade organization, IPC has their Wisdom Wednesday series. Um, SMTA has a number of videos. Bob, I think you're on several of those. If you're a member of those organizations, you have access to that. We have our Tech Tuesday webinars. Um, Mike Buto from uh, Circuits Assembly has a podcast called PCB Chat at pcbchat.com. Judy Warner from Altium has a uh, podcast uh, more on the board fab side, uh, but that's all, you know, there are brothers and sisters in this industry. You yourself, Bob, at uh, bobwillis.co.uk have a lot of online resources. Um, and I think you have a YouTube channel or something similar where uh, people can see a lot of the, the video work you've done where you uh, are unique in your profession where you actually manage to get the camera recording things that I haven't seen recorded on camera before. Uh, uh, real-time reflow and 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 uh, under a component uh, view, uh, BGAs, for example, as, as I recall seeing, just all sorts of uh, very technical, very hands-on support online. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I totally agree. I think education is is the future. It always has been around, but I think it right now represents more of the future than than pretty much anything else. And there are so many ways to access good quality non-commercial educational material out there. Well, that's us about out of time. So Bob, thank you once again for being my guest uh, on episode one and episode 40. Does that mean um, I'll be able to talk to you again on episode 80? If uh, you can put up with me again, it would be an absolute pleasure. And of course, uh, I'm 
as you know, I'm into uh, playing football, walking football, so uh, I'm always competitive. I'd be really interested to know what the scores on the doors are for 1 to 40. <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right. That sounds good. And um, I imagine with the you know worldwide lockdown right now, you're probably not getting a lot of scuba diving in. I know that's a big passion of yours. Uh, I'll, I'm sure you're looking forward to, for many reasons, uh, getting past this whole thing and you can get back under the water where you uh, where uh, you you find so much pleasure you're absolutely right uh, we had one uh, one trip sort of canned um, so hopefully very soon we'll be able to get out there again very good well uh, let's all hope that that happens sooner than later Bob thanks again for being my guest I really really appreciate it thank you well that's another episode thanks for joining me if you like what you hear, be sure and press the subscribe button so you'll be notified every time a new episode is available. Please continue to send your comments and suggestions. You can reach me at mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and most anywhere you get your podcasts. A special thanks to the folks at Ascendo Reliability and Circuits Assembly's PCB Chat both whom syndicate this and other podcasts at reliability.fm and pcbchat.com. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode of Reliability Matters. In the meantime, keep doing it right. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters. <laughs>